Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Welcome, Welcome to the Just Catholic, Catholic Podcast, Catholic where I'm, I'm literally, literally just Catholic, Catholic and, and today, today we have a special have guest, guest with us. Introduce, Introduce yourself. yourself. Hi, my name is Jasmine. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me to come along on the Just Catholic Podcast. Of course, Jazz. It's always a pleasure to be able to speak with you. How you doing? How you been? Um... I've been good. I feel like everyone says they're always good, <laughs> but I'm. But to be honest, I am. I'm. I'm pretty decent. But I guess to be more specific, um, I'm just really enjoying, like all the little things in life, and just really finding God in the ordinary, and just becoming a lover of silence. And I noticed that it has been like changing me a lot interiorly, and I noticed that, um, I'm becoming more not busy in my head. I'm mm-hmm. becoming more at peace and just really loving the silence and the everyday ordinary task of life. And they become extraordinary when I find God there. So it has been really, life has been good in that way. Very exciting in that little dry little way. <laughs> so yeah, I'm good in that way. Isn't it crazy that when you actually pause, there seems to be more things. It, it, I feel like when we actually give Jesus the chance to minister in our lives, so we actually pull the break, we can see that there are so many things to do, but we tend to avoid them because we try to make ourselves busy. Yes. Um, can you honestly just, ju- just re- can you just repeat that last part? No, it was, just it, really was, it, was a word, it was a word salad. Um, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> like, I feel like a lot of the times we keep ourselves busy. And we're saying that busy equals good because we're doing things. But in actuality, we're distracting ourselves from what the Lord wants us to do. So in that busyness, we think we're doing God's will. But in reality, we're avoiding the voice of God and what he's trying to say for us to do. Wow. Honestly, to be honest, it's really crazy that you mentioned that because that's literally the season that I'm in right now. I I had to take a step back from like a lot of things. Like I even... um, I'm currently doing a social media fast just for a month, just to reconnect in that silence. Cause I noticed that what you just said, I've been so busy. Like, although the, for me right now in life, my, the exterior is slow, but interior, I'm just so busy. Like my mind's racing. I'm constantly doing, I'm constantly distracting myself and I'm not hearing God. So I had to take a step back and let that business go like of my mind and my thoughts and really surrender that to God. So I can really hear his voice again. Um, so I totally get what you're saying, and that is so true, especially in the culture that we live in. It's just so fast-paced and busy, or such as, like, I want this now, or I want to do this now, and it's just so common, especially here and where we live. Yeah. I, I speak about this with my wife a lot of the times, where I feel like we don't know how to do nothing. Everything, <laughs> everything has to have a purpose, right? We yeah. can't just sit down and actually have leisure. Be- yes. And you know what? A culture that loses leisure ends up just becoming ex- anxiety ridden and they never stop working. Even when they're resting, they always find a reason to work. There is no Sabbath. That's so true. And I think it's because like people don't know how to be anymore. Like, especially like growing up. Like, especially being told, like, at the age of five right away, what do you want to be when you grow up? Like, always this question of, like, what are you going to do? What are you going to be? It's just, like, we're always, like, on this fast track, and we're never, like, told to just slow down. But our faith is so beautiful that it literally says, like, find God in the silence, mm-hmm. rest on Sunday. But us as humans, we want to do the opposite and try to take on the world. <laughs> and that's yeah. why we always, like, find ourselves, like, burning out so much and just speaking for myself and speaking from experience, I, I tend to do that a lot. But I'm learning to do the opposite because the more, like, less is more. Ever heard that saying that less mm-hmm. is more? Less is more. And I, and I think to your point, I think we make, I think nowadays this culture makes children grow up too fast, right? Yes. Like, we, we literally hand them an aging machine, a cell phone. And once you get, yes. once you get the kids a cell phone, legit, they're basically mini adults because they know everything that you probably know and probably more because of how technology has grown. And I, mm-hmm. and even, even when we were kids, I mean, that's that's the point. Like, why, why did we ask? You know, what do you want to be when you grow up? Like, okay, it's good for the kids to have a vision of what they want, but then at the same time, 
we don't let kids enjoy their childhood. Yes. We don't let them be children. We kind of want to make them mini adults automatically. Yes. Yes, that's very true. Like, technology, it can definitely be educational, but as you said, like, it, it is causing, like, a lot, especially the youth and the young children to just grow up really fast, and it's very distracting. Even for adults that are adults, they're very distracted now yeah. in this day with technology. If it's not ordered properly, it can definitely take over your life, and if it's not used properly in the kid's life and they're just indulging on it, it can really take over. Yeah, and I think that in the same way when we say that I would never commit a, a certain sin and then we end up committing it and then we end up feeling shameful about it, I think in the same way, like, we say to ourselves we won't get addicted to social media and then three hours later after scrolling through TikTok or Instagram Reels or, you know, five hours on YouTube or whatever it is, we're like, oh, my goodness. I, I You know, we, we we know that something's there. But we won't admit it to ourselves that the machine, the, the, the social media sites, are actually smarter than what we are. And they know how to hack our brains. Oh, that is so true. That That is true. It's like if it's like the, I think it's called the algorithm, I think it's called, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's like if you like our post or you watch this one reel or you comment, it just, it's automatically set up as like, I'm going to instantly put this on your feed and, and we end up getting sucked in. and. Um, yeah, it can really, it takes a toll on the brain and it's just so much information at once that it can be like overstimulating and very overwhelming. And then we just become very drained after a while. And I'm guilty of it too, of scrolling on N, as you mentioned. And I noticed that, noticed that about myself. And that's why I had to take a step back and fast for a little bit, re-encounter God and really, um, I guess, think about why. I'm on social media to begin with. Like, why am I posting? What's the purpose behind this post? Or why am I doing this? Or why am I posting that? Some may say I'm overthinking it, but I just speak it for myself. I like to be very intentional about what I'm doing. And I want I really want to have a purpose behind it and not just do things just because and and as you said, like just scroll at end because if you think about it, that time of hours or three hours, I couldn't been I could have used that time to perhaps maybe call a friend I haven't talked to in a while. Or maybe use that time to spend more time with God if I haven't today. Or use that time to maybe, hey, let me do a workout and take care of the temple that God has given me. But mm-hmm. instead I'm like um wasting my time scrolling on it. It would have been different. I'm like educating myself or learning for something that I need to do here at home or learning for other educational purposes but i'm just scrolling at end that has no benefit for my life in the sense i'm like just pouring out all my energy and nothing is pouring back in it's like i'm just giving my myself away to things that are no benefit for my life so yes i'm guilty of that i'm scrolling on end and that's why i oh, it's only been a few days but like i'm very i'm loving the no social media life right now um, and I know it'll come back into my life, but it's been beautiful so far of not having it at the moment, but it's only for one month. So we'll see how this fast goes. Pray for you, because let me tell you, it, it, it's really tough. And, and, and I think, yet again, we walk in with the good intentions and we did, then we just end up being sucked in. So like, I would, I would want to, I would want to ask you, like, what would be your plan to avoid getting sucked into the vacuum, right? To avoid like the doom scrolling, I guess the vocabulary for it nowadays is, or like, like constantly just, just going back to it, right? Because I I've done those before, and and I feel like I always end up just back at the beginning again, like just scrolling. Like what what's a good act? What would what would have you thought about it? I mean, I don't I don't want to put you on the spot with this one. But, like, have you thought about an action plan like afterwards after you're done with the fast? Um, yes and no, meaning that like I thought about it, but I have more thinking to do. So that's what I mean. But I do have, I guess, some action plan. It's still in the works, but I have like some idea. Um, so for me, because everyone's different. So for me, um, one of the things that I'm lacking in my life is structure and order. So if I'm going to go on social media, I'm going to make sure I have, it's going to be ordered. Like I, if I'm going to spend time 
on social media, I'm going to make it like, okay, it's from this time to this time, or it's only going to be for five minutes or 10 minutes. I'm going to, um, I'm going to make, make that order for myself. Or sometimes even turning off notifications really helpful. But when I go back on, um, for me, I'm going to, God willingly, who knows, God may change his plans but right now, what's in my heart and what Jasmine knows right here in this present moment is that I want to use social media to really, um, as a tool to evangelize and to really help those come closer to God. So when I go back on, that's going to be my main focus. Like I'm going to go back on and um, share the good news. So I'm going to make sure that's ordered. Like I'm not going to like go on it every day or I may just post and be like, oh, I'm putting my phone away. I'm not going to go to it right now because I know how I can get. So um, that's that's kind of what I have in mind right now. Of course, I do have like my own personal account, but I'm not going to like overindulge in it or spend too much time. That I'm still praying about um, myself. Like, oh, if I should keep that or not. But that's a whole other story for another day. But that's how I'm going to approach social media now. Like when I go back on, I'm going to, before I post something, who is this benefit? Is it for my glory? Is it for God's glory? Um, why am I doing this? And to help minimize the distractions, I'm going to be strict with myself, such as I, I'm not going to spend my time like 15 minutes or an hour on, unless I'm like on YouTube and I want to learn something about the faith, or maybe I'm listening to this podcast, or maybe... I'm learning something practical that helped my life. That's educational. So sometimes that takes longer and I'm learning as I'm going. But um, yeah, that's how I'm going to approach social media now. Just being really intentional and just being really more strict to myself. Yeah, Perhaps there could be a better, more action plan, but that's all I got. <laughs> no, no, no. That's that's actually really good. Um, You know, with any, with, I, I, I say that I basically anybody who has who is on instagram or youtube or twitter or whatever it is for more than two three hours i would classify it as an addiction which is basically most of our population nowadays and i think with addiction there's always the need of, a, of an accountability buddy one of the things i uh, i saw was a, a couple i went to this a couple months ago one of the things that they do is that they have the parental controls for each other's phones Oh yeah. They'll, they'll be like, oh, they'll be like, oh you know, they'll, 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 they'll they tell each other, I'm only going to get an hour of social media a month or an hour a week or like whatever it is. Right. But as soon as that hour is over, it locks. So you can't use the app anymore. Oh, I didn't know that the, um, the apps has that option. Yeah. Yeah. Accountability is so important. That's, that's very smart to do. So I was, I was thinking about doing it with, with, uh, with my wife but i was like oh you know i i'm still I'm, I'm still a little clinged on because of youtube but i think that's the last straw for me because i think instagram's getting old like like i don't know like i i, I think i see I, and i and i pray that i can see these more as tools other than entertainment mm, that's good right? I, I think we 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 turn social media into the modern tv so it's like i'm bored i'm just gonna scroll and and, and you know what's crazy? We don't remember what we've watched. If I were to ask you what you've watched, you don't remember. You just know that you've watched something. Like, it's not even beneficial. Yes, it just happens, like, on autopilot. Yeah. <laughs> like <we're> just watching. <laughs> you, ever, you ever notice, like, I, like during like, Lent, this Lent, happens to me. I say I'm not going to use social media, and automatically, automatically your 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 phone just ends up on Facebook or YouTube, and you're like, "How did I get here?" It's like, "Oh my goodness, my fingers know what to do already." Bad. I'm laughing because us humans are just so funny. <laughs> like we're all just so funny. Like we like our our imperfections can be just funny. Like you know, you just have to laugh at yourself at yourself sometimes. <laughs> Oh goodness! But um, really quick, because it just came to my mind. Mm -hmm. Sometimes something I've been thinking about for myself. This isn't the case for everyone, but maybe it can point to something deeper. Some questions I ask myself, like a lot of questions. Is there something I do? I just always ask myself questions. Um, and the one of the things I've been asking regarding social media is, okay, am I distracting myself? And if or why? what's what's the deeper purpose am i anxious about something and i want to get away from it and or if, am i experiencing an emotion i don't want to feel and i want to 
um, run away from it by distracting myself. Or maybe this is a big project or this thing I need to work on. And my um, coping mechanism is to just go on my phone. And these are questions that I ask myself. Um, maybe, um, like, whoever is, who are, whoever would end up listening or whoever is listening, um, maybe you can ask yourself those questions too. Like, why, why am I scrolling on end? What is my purpose? Am I running away from something? Am I trying to hide something? And maybe I don't want to feel something. And, and that's going back to what I originally said when, you, when we were first asking about what's going on in each other's lives. That was the main thing for me going on the fast was I was running away from something. Like I'm a very anxious person and sometimes I get overwhelmed easily. Maybe that's all of us. But for me, I, that's just how I am. And, um, and there's, well, I don't want to say how I am. It's something that I struggle with. Because that's not who we truly are. My anxiety is not me. My identity is in Christ. Um, and I notice that I run away by distracting myself with that. If it's not social media, maybe TV, maybe series. And I'm just constantly filling myself with not things that are that anything mean. I'm distracting myself with what really needs to be taken care of. And that's really God coming into those secret places to really help start healing that. And so that's when I went this fast. So he can start really going into those places. So I no longer have to run away to go and hide and distract myself. And then when I'm ready and when that's healed, I'll be stronger than ever when I reach um, social media and come back to it. Yeah. I feel like there's always, when you don't want to do something, there's always something else you can do. Procrastination. Yes, right. And yes. I think it's not only towards our, our physical lives, like a deadline or like a project, but I think there's also spiritual procrastination. God calls us to do something and we get distracted because there's a butterfly somewhere. Like, like, like we, we usually just find ways to avoid the thing that God wants us to do. I think about Jonah, right? Like Jonah, who was, God told him to preach. And he said, no, he ran away. And then he gets swallowed by a whale. Oh, fish, goodness. Yeah. Right. And he's in the belly of the whale, with the fish for three days. Mm-hmm. And finally, he, he, he understands from there. And then he goes and he, and he goes to preach to Nineveh. Nineveh is safe because they, you know, God told himself fast and made, you know, story of Jonah. But maybe we need that time in in the belly of the whale. Maybe we need that time where we're isolated and we can actually say to the Lord, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? I think I think that's that's why retreats are necessary. Right in the right. spiritual life, but also like we can have our own many retreats in these ways through our fasting and through our penance. It doesn't necessarily have to be going to a retreat, but like the fact that God allows us to fast and we can allow that grace to enter in us, that only means that we can be open to the voice of God anywhere. And I, I just really quick, Jasmine. How, there's going to be a change in topic, but how did you come to the Lord? What's, what's your yes, story? Yes, yes. Thank you, thank you. Um, just a, one slight comment. I just want to say that was very beautiful. Thank you. It it really touched me what you just said. But how did I come to the Lord? Um, I always find this question so interesting because when I look back on my life, there were just so many events that led me to come to know the um the lord and honestly um looking back at my timeline i would say that initial start started in my childhood um so for starters i didn't grow up um in catholic home when there was no practicing the faith uh i didn't even have any of my sacraments it, it took until 16 years old of my own decision to go um but I was told I was Catholic. Like I grew up with my grandmother and I grew up with my parents and I was just told I was Catholic. So although there was no faith being practiced out, I would say that started me searching for the Lord. And here's why. It's because my grandmother, although she she didn't practice, she wasn't practicing and she didn't really teach us anything. She did teach me the Our Father, the Hail Mary. And we said a prayer every night. And I might not say it right right now, but it was this prayer such as, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Angels watch me through and I keep me in your, I guess, blessed sight. Something like that. But anyway, it was just a cute little child prayer. And ever since I was a little girl, um, I guess 
looking back, that was the start of it all because I remember me just going outside in nature and I was just always mesmerized by the beauty. And for me as a little girl, I, I remember it so, so vividly. I remember just looking up in the sky and I'm like, there is someone here. And I remember saying like, I don't know who you are, but I know you exist. And I just started singing this random song as a nine-year-old girl. And I was like, the grass, the trees, the sky above me, nature, nature, how wonderful sight I can see. And I, started, and I just started singing that over and over and over again. And I'm like, I want to get to know you more. It's like my grandma gave me that little, that little taste of it. So just prayers. Um, but then looking at nature for me, that just captivated me. And I just like, I just knew someone was there. And I literally said, I don't know who you are, but I want to get to know you. And God saw this desire of this little girl. He saw like my innocence and he just started placing people in my life. And, but it, this didn't take place until I got a bit older, but, um, it did start in elementary school. Um, but it didn't really take off until I got older. And he started placing friends in my life. And there was a specific friend in my life that was Catholic and her family was Catholic. And every time I went to her house, they were playing the rosary. Um, they were doing prayers. Um, and then when I got older, I think this is when I think you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, there was this ministry called Jersey Ministries. And I think it started in 2014. Uh, I think it was 2014. And then this friend, um, she invited me to this ministry and then that's when it really started taking off for me um and I remember the night as if it was like yes I walked in and I felt this presence like never before and I'm like I knew God always was real like ever since a little girl I always had this faith but that was just like confirming it even more I'm like I know you're real like I feel a presence I never felt before in my life and you're here um so that was really the takeoff of my, of my relationship with, with Jesus and me coming to know him. But I do want to emphasize this because I believe this is very important, especially looking back at my life. So although my grandma introduced it to me as a little girl, what really brought me closer to Jesus and come to encounter Jesus, I would say was the suffering. So I didn't grow up with um, a mom or dad. And I got placed in the home with my grandmother, but it wasn't a home that was safe. It wasn't a home where I was protected. It was like I experienced emotional, physical, and verbal abuse. And usually uh, when someone experiences that, they start questioning God or maybe they don't believe in God. But I was, I started doing the opposite. I was like, Lord, I need your help. Like, I don't know who you are. I don't really, I don't, I just know you're real. Like I just automatically had this faith for whatever reason. I just did. And I just started begging for his help. So through that suffering, through what I experienced, um, that's how I, I came to know Jesus more. And then God gave me that extra push by putting the proper people in my life, bringing me into a ministry that was Catholic. And that led me to start my my walk with God. It led me to start getting my sacraments. It led me to start, just start developing a relationship with Jesus. Full transparency, by the way. Um, thank you <laughs> first first of all that was what a, what a story um i just really wanted to say for the audience out there we served in the same ministry for a couple of years um jrc was where i got my start as well did i ever tell you about my first time going to jrc i never heard your first time well this one's a doozy um so so I was actually introduced to it by a friend as well, and he had told me that on Friday nights, they were going to go to a movie, and it was going to be at this church, but from the church, we were going to go to the movie theater. I was a kid who didn't really go out much, so I was like, oh my goodness, basically a field trip, but you know, not in school. So I was excited. I go. Number one, they canceled the movie. We didn't get to go to the theater. So I was already a little peeved by then. But then what really hit me is that I walked into a charismatic ministry without understanding anything that was going on. So I go in and I'm hearing the word of God. I'm like, you know, I'm here. I'm going to hear the word of God. And it was, it was good. I forgot who preached. It was probably Deacon Diaz. And then... We answered this prayer 
and people are crying and falling. Mind you, this is my first experience. Me too. <laughs> and I'm just looking around and I'm like, what? I entered into a cult. I'm in a cult. I'm like, oh my goodness. Where am I? What do I, what do, I do? But then I, but then something I noticed is that when they got back up, I saw that they, these people were lighter. But not even that. I, I saw that I would talk to them, but they and they, they kept on coming back. And I'm like, you just fainted, and now you're coming back? Like, what's the deal? Like, is that like a medical thing? I, I, was, I was really, I was really wondering at this point. But it created a curiosity in me to a movement I never knew about. I always saw the church as, you know, basically Sunday Mass, and that's it. I didn't even think of the possibility of a ministry in a Catholic church, because in my family, we just grew up as just, you know, here, do your sacrament, okay, that's it, and that's all you need to do. It wasn't really a relationship with Jesus in so much as we only needed him when things went wrong, or when we prayed in Christmas. That's about it. And I don't know about you, but I, I think for me, one of the biggest shifts for me was JRIC. It was for me, too. That, that ministry really just, it helped me to know that God was a person. Yes. It opened like a whole, it opened a whole new door in my life, like a whole new realm. Like, what is going on? Yeah. Um, it was the start of it all. I thought these people were paid off by the diocese at first. I thought it was a bunch of people who are getting payroll so that they pretend to love Jesus. When I found out they weren't getting paid and they still loved it, I was like, okay, there's something going on here. Like there's something deeper here that these people are willing to volunteer their time to look after a bunch of kids on a Friday night. I'm like, okay, wait, there's something here. That's, I mean, that's how I, that's how I fell in love with Jesus. Yes, and when they just spoke the word of God, it's like you just felt the presence of God. Like it wasn't just anyone just talking or just sharing. It was like God was speaking through them. It's like His presence just filled the atmosphere. It was just something so different that you wouldn't feel for me for my life coming to that something I would have never felt before. So. Yes, I I 100% agree with you. That's when that's when my faith started to take off more, and that's when I started to develop more of a relationship with with Jesus. And, that, and as you said, like as a person, getting to know Him as a person and as a friend, um, such a beautiful time. And I'm so thankful. May God bless them. And the ministry is still going, by the way. God bless them, bearing so much fruit. It's amazing. Yeah, I I, I mean to your point, you're. Going back to the suffering we are speaking about, I think Catholicism began to make sense with me as soon as I found out about redemptive suffering. Like, God suffered and his suffering became redemptive because of the cross. So because of the cross, we too can suffer with him and we too can bring it to him and he can make something beautiful out of that. Like to me, as soon as I, as soon as I actually realized that my whole life completely flipped really wow like yeah, right I, when you heard that it just flipped for you right when i in like when i, like when I understood, I understood it, it like everything, everything became an opportunity of grace wow that is the amazing worst thing, the worst thing that that, that happens or like something terrible or i feel depressed or you know whatever it is I knew that God can do something with it. And it, wow. it changed me. Mm-hmm. You know, That's beautiful. And, yeah, and, and I think just to clarify, like, we shouldn't hit ourselves and be like, oh, God, look, I'm suffering again. It's like, no, like, we're supposed to live our lives the way God wants us to, but when suffering happens, we can allow God to minister to us in that point so that he can create basically how can i say this kind of like beautiful wounds 
Oh, I yeah. like that. Do you know Beautiful how incense wolves. is made? Yeah. Wow. Do you know how incense are made? It's actually really cool. I don't know how it's made, so I'm, I'm excited to hear this. So they stab the certain tree, right? They basically puncture it. Mm-hmm. And then the, the tree oozes out the sap. And with that sap, it hardens, it crystallizes. And that's what the incense at mass, that's what they are. So, like, it's, it's supposed to be symbolic of, like, we, of, like, Jesus giving his wounds or even us joining in that sacrifice and it becoming a beautiful offering to God. Wow. Almost like a beautiful bouquet. Yeah. Flowers of sweetness. Yeah. So, wow. Like, because I don't know, because I know that you had a, maybe a distinction, like, like thanks to your grandmother, for, you know, what a blessing that she was even able to teach you the, the Hail Mary and the Our Father. But like, what, what made you, what made you choose the Catholic Church, right? Because, I mean, I know there was probably a variety of places you could have gone. So like, what? What drew you more towards the church? Yes, that is a very, very good question. So when I was first starting my walk with God, the denominations for me, I wasn't paying any mind to it. I was just like, oh, it doesn't matter. I just want to just get to know Jesus. And that's that's all I was focusing on. But then when I started to get older, I wanted to, I wanted answers. I'm like, why? Because the ministry was Catholic and um, I started going to church here and there. I wasn't really committed on Sundays until my friend told me, like, no, you need to go. Like, God says you have to go. And I'm like, I didn't know that. I didn't know it was that holy day obligation. I had no idea. I was just learning. Um, so I would just go, but it was just so boring. But then I just started questioning. I'm like, why do we do what we do? Why do we have sacraments? Why do we have the mass? How is Jesus present in the Eucharist? Like, I wanted, like, the deep answers, like, so much. But even without knowing the answers, this is why I chose to become Catholic. So one day I went to adoration, um, the Blessed Sacrament, Jesus in the Eucharist. And I didn't even know that I was Jesus in the Eucharist. I had no idea what was happening on the altar. I didn't even know what a monstrance was. It just didn't make sense to me. But when I went, I felt like a peace like no other. And it was like that night, like in the youth ministry, like there's something here. There's something bigger going on here. And I had no idea what it was. Um, So just knowing that Jesus was present in the Eucharist, I was like, I just knew that I was home. Like ever since I stepped from the Catholic Church, I just felt this homeness. Like this is where I need to be. Now I need to learn about it. So that's when I started asking questions. That's when I started getting my sacraments. And then when I got older, that's when I decided to go to school for theology so I can learn more. Um, like I wanted to know the deep stuff. And so that's why I chose the Catholic faith. And it, if it wasn't clear, it was that moment in the Eucharist. For me, it just it just set it off. Like I just knew I was home. And then the second part was now I just need to know more. Yeah, I mean, I just finished watching this uh, movie on the Eucharist. And one of, one of the things that I remember when I was... um when I was watching the movie, just in the beginning of my path, how important the Eucharist was to me. I I remember so many times when, like maybe the first couple years as I was entering into the ministry, I, I went through a I went through a really deep depression. And one of the things that would that was always there for me was the Blessed Sacrament. And I remember there was this one church in town that was always open and just sitting there and just being with him. I mean, just, that's another thing. That's another thing other than suffering. It's like, once you recognize the real presence, you can't go anywhere else. Yes. How can you? If we have Jesus Christ, how can we go anywhere else but home? Exactly. Yeah, it, it's it really just it it, it flips you. It, it changes you. Yeah. Yes, he's just so present. 
in the Holy Eucharist. Yeah. And I love what you just said. It's like once you know what you encounter that, there's literally no going back. Oh. And it just amazes me not not to um go on a tangent just to make a quick comment. It amazes me because there's just so many Catholics that that go to Mass every Sunday or since they're kids and they still have no idea what's happening in the Eucharist what's going on, or what's going on upon the altar. And this isn't to judge or this isn't to say, oh, they're bad Catholics. No, no, this is just this is just to say that, wow, like we need to we need to teach each other better. This is to say that, oh, we need to be better um catechized or better informed or we just need to help the body of Christ more. So it just amazes me that some people just haven't had the encounter yet. Yeah, and I think it just shows us that, number one, we're, the church is lacking in her evangelical zeal, right? I, I think, yes. you know, during these past years, we've we've kind of fallen back to that. We've kind of fallen back. And we can see that by people literally not understanding what's going on on the altar. You know, but I also think that one of the symptoms of the problem is the families, right? If we're only sending our kids to the equivalent of one, two, maybe three, four years, not even that, let's bring it back because it's not even every day. Let's say the equivalent of a year of catechetical education for a whole lifetime. And we expect them to basically grasp all of that within that little short year. I really don't think that's how you draw Catholics. I really think think that that when it comes to to really deepening our faith, it does start with the family. It does. You're right. Like, the family is a vital cell to society. And uh, I forgot which pope said it, but um, the church said something like this, that that the education, it first starts with the parents. And and to be honest, when I worked as a parish secretary one time, like, it's... It's sad, but a lot of parents actually believe that um, they just learn their faith in the formation classes, and then at home, nothing happens. Yeah. Um, but that's not the case. Like the formation classes should just be like that extra push or that extra or that extra education. But all that faith formation should be happening within the home. That it should be happening in the domestic church, in the the Christian family at home, first and foremost. And I think different than apologetics or maybe a theological explanation, I think it's actual encounter with the Lord at the Blessed Sacrament. Or even more, seeing people encounter Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament in an authentic and reverent way. And I think that really changes people because if something's really special or you don't know what's going on and this, this person is treating it as special, you're going to be like, oh, what's, what is that? And why are they treating it in that way? You know? Yes. It's That's so kinda, true. It's kind of, I think, um, um, who was it? Well, first well, it's Flannery O'Connor. Oh, uh, right? so good. <laughs> right? And uh, she says, uh, if the Eucharist is just a symbol, then to hell with it. Yes. Right? Like, like she's very poignant. And it, it, it's a well-known quote, but it makes sense. If it's just a symbol, that's out with it. And I think a lot of the times we, because of our earthly lenses, we don't get to see Jesus in the sacrament because we treat Sunday as a ritual. It just becomes a mid, a mid mass snack. And we don't really deepen and really dig deep into what is happening on the altar. Yes. Yes. It's a lot of lukewarmness out there. And I like what you just said about, like if they were to see someone in the adoration and they'd be like, oh, what's going on? It made me think about like if kids also saw their parents like actually praying on their knees and actually living out their faith, they'll probably be like, oh, why is mommy doing that? Or why is daddy doing this? Oh, what's going on here? Oh, we're going to go and give sandwiches to the poor? My, oh, why? How come? Why do we do this? I think it would spark like a, like a little like curiosity, like, oh, mom and dad, why are we doing this? But of course, not every family dynamic is like that. You know, probably in the perfect world, those will probably be the responses. But yeah. as you said, yes, it it does um, cause curiosity mm-hmm. in the young ones. And even anyone, especially were to see them, like even praying in the Blessed Sacrament, it will spark that curiosity. Like, so 
especially seeing someone with a deep devotion, it makes you want to like question like, oh, I noticed something different. The way this person, like anyone could just pray, but the way this person's praying and their devotion, it makes you want to get to know that person. Or wait, or have you ever like just talked to someone and you just know that there's just this glow to them? It's just like, I want to get to know that person. What's what's different about them? What's the zeal? What's this passion? And and if more like as you said, the the, um, the families, if more families were like that and seeing that passion, I truly believe that the the kids will will begin to follow along, especially when they see the dad, because the dad is you know the head of the household and the leader, and that leader needs to be really rooted in the faith. Um, so it's very important. Um, I can talk a lot about the Christian family, but um, not not to go too deep into that. But, no, it's, it's yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think about um. I think about uh, Saint Therese. Uh, there was a story. There was a part of her life where she's um, she's at church with her father, and it was the feast day of Saint Teresa of Avila, and her father goes to her and goes, "Look, little little princess." That's what he used to call her. Oh, and talking about your saint, and Saint Therese looks up at him, and you could see the tears welling up in his eyes. And Therese says. That was one of the biggest inspirations for her was her father. Just seeing her father and how devout and how attentive he was during the liturgy, during the homily. Mm-hmm. Just like to that, that, that changed her. You know, and, and can we imagine a St. Therese without maybe uh, a Zell and Louis Martin, uh, their, her parents, right? It wouldn't be the same Therese that we have now. Right, and yet again, God, you know, not to discount, God can do anything with, with brokenness, of course. But I, I think about some of these beautiful stories where there's an inspiration from from a parental figure. Yeah, yeah. 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 Speaking of parental figures, we're actually going to go to the topic of today's podcast forty minutes in, which is wonderful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that's just really funny. No, it is. It is. <laughs> no, and, and, okay. I, and I told God's you. in control. Yeah, exactly, exactly. exactly. And I told you before the podcast started, like, it's just going to be a conversation. It's just going to be full barrels ahead. Like, it's just going to be something where it's just free-flowing. So, yeah. The Virgin Mary. Which is what I, I uh, wanted to talk to you about. It's something that I discussed with you. You wanted I, I I asked you to come on the podcast and give you a topic, and the first thing you said was the Blessed Virgin Mary. Why Mary? Why Mary? Yeah. So what? Why? Why? Um, I chose her as a topic. I, not as a topic, but like, why? Why is Mary so special? Why is Mary so special to me? Yeah. Um, Mary is so special to me for various reasons. Um, so for starters, when I first came into the faith, like after my sacraments, once I chose to become Catholic fully, um, by the way, did you choose a confirmation name? Oh, a confirmation saint? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was the little flower, St. Therese. Oh. (laughs) Yes, yes. I chose her. Yes. She's amazing. I love her. Um, but yes, um, for starters, like, um, although I became fully Catholic, out of all the church teachings, the one teaching I struggled with was Mama Mary. I cannot understand her role. I did not understand who she was. And then when someone told me, oh, you had to have a relationship with her, pray to her, I was like, what? I never heard this before. What does this mean? Why do we have to pray to her? We can just go to God, go to Jesus. Like, I just couldn't comprehend. It just didn't make sense. I'm like... I don't understand her. Like, I understand we honor her. I understand that she gave birth to Jesus. But isn't that it? Like, that's it. Why do I need to have this connection with her? It just didn't make sense to me. So I started praying to God. I'm like, God, please. I believe I wasn't against the teaching. I just didn't understand. So I'm like, I was like, Lord, please help me understand your mother. Like, I want to understand. I want to understand this teaching. I love you. And I want to love all things that you love. Help me understand her, please. And then, um. This is when um, he started bringing my husband into my life. Um, but this is when we were just friends. And he had this big devotion to Mama Mary. 
And he introduced me to a class and it was this ministry called Bonds and Mary and Love. So I was like, okay, I'm going to join this class. And I joined and it was for nine months. I thought it was beautiful because, you know, motherhood, carrying baby for nine months. And then this class was for nine months. And basically at the end of it, you're becoming a brand new person. That's just how I saw it. Maybe it's just me just overthinking. I'm like, oh, it's beautiful. Nine months with Mama Mary. So I went to this class and we started, I started learning about Mama Mary more, her role and who she is. And I just started to fall in love with Mama Mary understanding that like she doesn't she doesn't replace god like she isn't god she even says in the word of god um uh, in, the, in the word of god she says that i am the handmaid of the lord be it done unto me according to thy word and she literally humbles herself but understanding the gift that she is and the gift that jesus gave us and really changed my whole perspective of mama mary because at the cross you know what did jesus say he gave us his mother and he gave us his mother to us as a gift. And it's just so fitting for our salvation. Like, it just makes sense that if we have a heavenly father, then we're going to have a heavenly mother. And it just makes sense. And for someone that grew up without a mother, this is why I also cherish Mom Mary even more. Um, like, because I yearn for that mother and daughter relationship. I yearn to, like, call up my mom or invite her over to have tea. Like, I, I really, I really want that. Um, who knows God may, may get that to me in due time or prepare any relationships that need to be prepared. Um, but for now I just reach out to mom Mary, like in a very childlike way, like mom, I need help or mom, please cradle me like a baby. Please give me a hug. And I just feel her motherly care upon me. And this is why I have like a very specialness to her. Um, yes, because she's mother God. Yes, because Jesus gave us to her, but also because of like my personal circumstances as well of just yearning to a mother. So I go to her a lot. And something I really want to emphasize is that when I came to her and when I got to understand her and I, when I started to have a relationship with her, it really took my relationship with Jesus to a whole nother level. Like it helps me understand her son even more. I started to live my life more devoutly. I started to just. I feel like I enter a new place into the Lord's heart. And if you look at all the saints, like they all had, they were all married and they all had a relationship with Mama Mary. It's like she's a gift that Jesus gave, um, that Jesus gave us. And not to sway away from the topic of why you say, why you ask, um, why is Mary, um, why, why you value Mama Mary so much. But I do want to emphasize this and because it, it breaks my heart because so many Catholics believe today that, oh, we don't need Mama Mary or she's optional. Oh, I don't need to relationship with her. And that's not that's not true. That's not Catholic theology. It's like Jesus gave us his mother. He gave us to her. And like not to go too, too deep in this, but um, one of my professors oh, hey, from. Time, bro. You're good. Oh, OK, OK. Yeah. <laughs> and this is this has no time limit. This is a question okay, of... beautiful. Oh. <laughs> and one of my professors from Franciscan of Steubenville, this, this may come off a little harsh, but one of my professors said something so powerful. He said to reject the gift of Mary from Calvary is to reject um, the gift of Jesus. I'm like, whoa, Ooh. that's so powerful. I'm Ooh. like, that's so true. Because yeah. it just makes my heart that... A lot of Catholics just believe that we don't need Mary or she's optional, but she's not optional because she was optional. Then Jesus wouldn't have gave us to um, gave us her like he gave us her for a reason. Like we're human. Jesus is literally God, the Lord of all Lord, Lord of all Lord. Sorry. So he knows what he's doing. <laughs> he knows why he knows why we need Mama Mary. Like there's a reason why we need her. Like, um. I'm going to quote this so wrong, but there's a St. Um, Louis Den Montfort. Maybe you can correct me if I'm saying his name wrong. Saint but he Louis says like, yes. And he said something along the lines. Not going to quote it right. But if you know it, please, please say it. Because I'm going to mess it up. But he says something like how um, Mary is the easiest, shortest, and fastest way to Jesus. Mm-hmm. And, and And that's so beautiful. It's like it's also like saying how she's like the easiest and shortest way to heaven as well. Um, the way I see it, 
because my mind I'm a very like person that's visual and I like to like connect things to my mind so like for example um think about it um I'm gonna make something up uh okay upstate New York and say you're all the way from New Jersey who knows there are so many ways to get to upstate to New York you can drive maybe take an airplane maybe ride a bike maybe go walking you got all these paths but there's always one that's easier and that's how I, and that's how I also tie it in with our spiritual life. We have all these ways. You may want to do all these things regarding your faith. Like we may want to do all these practices, may want to do all these devotions. But Jesus already gave us a person that helps us through it all, and who literally brings us to, um, who literally brings us to Him straight away, and the one that also perfects our prayers and brings it to Jesus as a beautiful bouquet of flowers, just as she did at the wedding feast of Cana. When she brought the request to Jesus and she just perfected that intention. And what did Jesus do? He didn't reject his mother. He answered it. He responded. Yeah, well, that woke me up. Thank you, Jess. Um, <laughs> You're welcome. Well, on, like, thank, you, <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for using your vessel. But. But I was, I was just seeing, like, I never thought of it in that way. Like, to reject, to reject the Marys, to reject the gift that Jesus has given us, right? Like, he literally offered his mother to us, which is actually kind of a huge deal. It's so <laughs> yeah. huge. Yeah. Like, it's kind of like a handing, it's, oh, I, I think about so many things about Mary, but one of the things I really like is the, um, the aspect of her, you know, Christ is new Adam, Mary's the new Eve, right? Yes, Which, oh, really, I love this. Really digging deep into that, right? Like, even, even him calling her woman at Cana? says so much it, I, I did it then, and i think you know when i read it in the beginning i misinterpreted it i was like oh my goodness is jesus going off on his mother like woman like it's not my time but no 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 jesus is pointing and jesus is taking us straight back to the garden and he's you know what does adam what does adam call the person that's created from his side calls her woman and it's as oh, i never connected that it's the beginning of what will be the consummation of heaven and earth. What would be the, 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 the bringing together of the new Adam and the new Eve. It, it, it's, it's really incredible. And then what is it that what is it that he calls Mary at the cross when he gives her to John? He says, woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. Yes. He points to he points to it already. Yes. And, and, and God, oh so sorry. No, no, <laughs> I think we're ahead. both getting excited. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go, go, go. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. You're well, like finish that beautiful thought. No, no, I was just I was just thinking like Mary is what embodies Ephesians five. Husbands love your wives as Christ loves his church. Right, and Mary being the perfect architect of the church shows how much Christ loves us. Christ shows his great love through the work of Mary. And I think in the same way, like we are called to be fully receptive of that love of Jesus so that we ourselves can become gifts as Mary was to us. So, Wow, that was a really great connection. Um, thank you, thank you as well, because that helped. That gave you like a a further and different perspective. That was that was great. That was great stuff right there. <laughs> that was really good. Um, wow, I was gonna say something. Oh yes, yes. Speaking about um the wedding feast at Cana, one of the one of my professors once said, um, I don't know, top of my head, the original Greek text, and plus I don't speak Greek, so I might just say it wrong. But that part, um, I'm just paraphrasing. That part when Jesus says, woman, um, 
maybe you remember exactly what Jesus said. What did he say when he said, woman? Woman, what does this have to do with me? Something like that. Yes. Hold on. Oh. Kena. Yes, let's get these texts right now. Let's yeah. see what happens. Gotta, gotta proof text this. Come on. Yeah. John. Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Yes. So what I find so amazing about that part is that my professor, um, when he, he presented the original Greek text and he broke it down um, into what it um, originally said, it says the same thing, but you know how things can be worded in different ways. Mm-hmm. It basically was saying, what is it? What is this to you? And what is this to me? Basically, like... I'm going to modern I'm going to make it like more modern. Basically, it's just like are you ready now? Like when we do this when I do this first miracle, like this starts like the mission, like his like his first public miracle. It it really reveals um Jesus as a new Adam and Mary as a new Eve. Like it really starts that um that mission in the way of like what is going to happen. Like their role starts more starts to come more to light. And that's how the professor professor um was explaining it. I'm like, oh, that's very beautiful. Like I never saw it that way because the same as you, I I used to look at that text like, why did he call his mom woman? Like in this day and age, that's, that seems kind of disrespectful. But it's a different time back then. <laughs> so, and plus, um, it also has like a beautiful theology meaning behind it, as you explain, especially um back in the in Genesis, um. So I also find that really beautiful. And what I also find very beautiful about Mama Mary is that how um, Eve in the Old Testament, how sin came through a woman, well, both like men and women, but how sin came through a woman, but also how redemption also came from a woman, like Jesus Christ came from her, from her womb. Um, so I find that very beautiful as well. No, and I... also get really theological here. Wait, I'm so sorry. What were you going to say? No, no, no. Go, 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 go. Oh, <laughs> to get like more theological here. What I also find so beautiful is that if you look at the whole Bible, it's just like a whole love story. Like if you mm-hmm. go from Genesis, it's like God is constantly trying to be one with the people of Israel, almost like a marriage. Like he just wants to be one. So yes. you already see there that God is one big on marriage, two, he's big on family. And mm-hmm. then when you get to the New Testament, it ends in the wedding feast of the Lamb. That's what it literally says in scripture, wedding feast of the Lamb. And if you tie it all together, it just, to me, I don't I don't know how else to explain it, but it just makes sense about why, why it's fitting, like, to also have a heavenly mother. Like, he would, God been big on family and marriage since the very beginning. Since the very beginning, it makes sense he's going to continue that to the very end. And it just makes sense that he knew that some people were going to be orphans. He knew that some people weren't going to have mothers. He knew that some people were, some people weren't going to have parents growing up. And not just that, even those that do have parents. But God is a God that just knows all these things, of course, before we, before we even do. Like, he's all knowing. So it just yeah. makes sense that not only do, do we call on our Heavenly Father, we can go to our Heavenly Mother. This isn't to say that Mama Mary is going to replace God. No, she can't. She even says that. She even recognizes that. But she just brings us gently to Him. And she does so in a very perfecting way. Um, so, yeah, I just want to just mention that because looking at the whole story of creation, the whole story of salvation, it just all ties together, especially with the wedding feast of the Lamb and how we're all called brides and how Jesus is the groom and it's just so beautiful. Yeah, and what I love is Revelation twelve when it just when it describes the Virgin Mary. And it's what I find really unique and um I heard Dr. Han, uh, Dr. Sky Plan talk about this where eleven um Revelations eleven speaks about the, the Ark of the Covenant. Right. If you know salvation history, you know the Ark of the Covenant is what they brought into battle. The Ark of the Covenant was the way that Moses was able to see God through the mercy seat of the covenant. Right? Uh, of, yeah, the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. The thing about this is that the Jews after they, they had to hide the Ark away. And the Ark just disappeared. Right? So imagine being a Jew reading Revelation, and John, is, John sees the Ark, 
And so they're already so they're like, already whoa, like, whoa. Tell us about tell us the art. Where is it? And then John in Revelation 12, 12 continues to, to describe a woman. Mm-hmm. With the 12 stars and robed with the sun with the moon under her feet. And she was in labor. And she gave birth to a child who had a rod, which is like a symbol of power. And they're like, whoa. Oh. So the ark. So that's that's where we get the connection of, of Mary being the new ark of the covenant. That's because John in Revelation describes her as the ark. You see, the oh, chapters wow. don't come. Yeah. The chapters in the Bible don't come until years later. But it's but one it's continuous one thing. thing. Mm-hmm. So eleven and twelve are actually really connected in terms of, of, of Revelation. It's really cool, and and like even going back to the topology that you were talking about, which is essentially a connection between the old and the new. Death came to a tree. So God literally nailed himself to death. And through the tree came life now. I never saw that connection before. That was, wow. It's amazing. I have to write that down. <laughs> wow. How did you, did you hear that from somewhere? Or did you just think about that? You know, you know what's crazy? Most, most of the insights, I, I am the most unoriginal person in the world. Really, like, I mean, in terms of like when I learn about things, I get it from somewhere. It, it's like sometimes, you know, the Lord gives me some glory, but uh, not not really. I, I really suck. So I would say that um that one I probably got from one of the early church fathers, which I would recommend if 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 you do have a chance, you know about the liturgy, the hours, right? Yes. Do the office, the office. Right. If you don't want to do the morning prayers, that's fine. But read the office of readings. Just go down to the readings and you'll read some of the most beautiful homilies from the church fathers or the saints of the day. And you will get some of these insights that these people have have, you know, inspired by the Holy Spirit. You read this, you're like, oh, my goodness, this is amazing. But, yeah, that was I think that's from an early church father. Wow, that's that's beautiful. It's like all these little hidden mysteries that yeah. I would never thought about until brought to light. I mean, who knows? I don't want to say never thought about it. You never know what God can do. But <laughs> that was really beautiful. I never heard that one before. But that just connects the dots even more. Even more so. It makes it, it, makes it more... I, 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 God, God is a great is storyteller. And if we allow him to tell our story, our story becomes more interesting and more greater than we can ever create it. Wow. Yes. There's like, there's something I, I wanted to mention. It was about um, redemptive suffering. You mm-hmm. were the one that initially brought it up, especially when I started talking about my story and suffering, how that brought me closer um, to God, like with the first question that you asked. Um, mm-hmm. And also ties with Mama Mary and how she suffered mm-hmm. just so much. And it was even prophesied that a sword was going to pierce her heart. Mm-hmm. And and I know I'm not the only one. Like, I know there's many people in life that may have questioned God, like, oh, why is the suffering happening? Or they tend to want to stray away from the faith because of all the bad that happens in their life. And um, Mama Mary, you know, she's our mother. And she not only did Jesus show us how to suffer, but she did as well, too. Like, she showed us how to carry out the mission, even when you have a broken heart, how to really find that joy in the suffering and still love no matter what and words it sounds so easy but when it comes to the action it's it's really hard it's not easy and i just want to mention this um kind of backtracking a bit and i'm going to tie my mary into it um when i initially first said um how I, how the suffering brought me closer to jesus i don't want to be so vague in that i just want to just really emphasize that um i was once a very angry person like although i had faith although i believed i i couldn't understand what was happening in my life and i was just angry the thought of people just telling me oh just offer it up or this or we're done to suffering uh, like oh i was new to the teachings but for me i was just angry i'm like listen you're not living my life you can't tell me to just do that this is not easy i come home every day to abuse how am i gonna offer this up this doesn't make no sense 
<laughs> um, but there is something I do want to emphasize here. I guess it's just, I guess my cautious side coming out right now. I do want to emphasize that, like, like, of course, God does not desire for you to, to be abused. Like, he doesn't want, he doesn't desire for you to be hurt. He doesn't desire for you to literally be like a doormat. Like, he doesn't desire that for you. Um, and if anyone is in a really harmful situation, like definitely, you know, reach out, you know, for help regarding that. But just talk about like, you know, the regular day suffering such as like, oh, maybe you lost your job or maybe someone said these harsh things to you, you know, because in life we're going to suffer regarding those like, yes, like, like that it's okay to just stay there and be there. But if you're really enduring, like really abuse, like really serious, like even domestic violence, like like I'm not just I don't want I just want to make it clear like don't just stay there and just offer up and can you, can you take it yes God can still make them do something beautiful but maybe you need to like be in a more safer place first um I don't want to get off topic but I just found my heart to just say that because sometimes when it comes to the faith when we say offer it up some people can be in really dangerous situations yeah. and they just think they have to stay there um and that's not entirely true all the time mm-hmm. uh, I know that's a bit of topic but I think no, that has to be known. <laughs> and let people know that. <laughs> no, because um, uh, we're we're not, like I said, we're not called to kick ourselves. We're not called to put ourselves in, in a sense of danger, either yes. to our soul or to our physical bodies or to our, to our whatever it is. Like, we're not, we're not called to intentionally hurt ourselves, right? That would, that would be something that would, that's, that God wouldn't want. You know, I, I, when it when it comes to uh, when it comes to suffering, well, when it comes to redemptive suffering, I, I I think I think back to like I mean, not think back. I would say like even now, right in this in in the, where we live now, we tend to avoid the hard things because yeah. the easy things are easier. Mm-hmm. So the things that we should do are hard. The things we don't want to do are easier so we tend to do the things we want to do and avoid the things we don't so that's that's something that um my wife taught me and she learned it from the missionaries of charity like they always taught her you know do do the hard things first right do the hard things first and i think that's where that's where redemptive suffering comes in right in, in that example right like we should always seek the things that are good but know that when you seek the good, there is suffering in the good. Because if the greatest good of all time, which is God dying, right, which was the greatest evil at the same time, that's the, that's the irony of the cross. The greatest evil becomes the greatest blessing. Right? Like, we killed God. As human beings, we killed our creator. And instead of our creator coming back in vengeance, he came back in a merciful love for us like yeah, that, that that's unheard of in any other religion any other philosophy any other historical figure that a creator comes in dies for you you're they're killed by their creation and yet he still loves them and still asks for them he still grants them peace like he says you know what does he say to the apostles when he resurrects peace be with you peace be with you shalom 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 and i I, you know with our suffering right like the hardest things are the things that god wants us to do and since we're not accustomed to living a holy life yet we see those things as very bitter and suffering and that's where the, the redemption comes in. That's how I think about it. Yes. No, that was really good. That was so beautiful. And it just reminded me, like, although I didn't, I didn't understand what's happening in the moment as a little girl, this might sound ridiculous. Maybe this might anger people. If I'm being honest, looking back in my life, I, I don't, I, I'm not happy for what was done and happened to that little girl that was innocent. But I'm thankful for it. And here's the place why. As you said, God, he turned that ugly mess into something beautiful. And it definitely made me a stronger person. So that when I face persecution, that when I face suffering, I don't stumble. Like, I 
I don't like get so swayed easily or or lose my faith. My faith just becomes stronger. I'm like, oh, fire is gonna come. I'm gonna head. I'm gonna go straight on head in, and it's not gonna hint. I'm not gonna fall because Jesus is with me. So through that persecution, suffering, it just only made me stronger. Um and and also and also just purified me more because you know through the suffering we 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 purify and I'm not saying as if like I'm a perfect person I'm a saint no I'm very flawed and I have a lot to work on but through that suffering through that mess it did make me a more sweeter gentle person because I was we all come we all start off as we all start off as gentle we're little babies but because of my circumstances I I was very I was ticked off easily I was always angry. <laughs> I'm laughing because of of where it was like oh wow like I was that person I can't believe it um but God he he did he tur- he turned me into a beautiful garden and it's it may still have some weeds there I still have a lot of digging to do and he still has to pull some out but it's more of flowers now I'm more of a garden full of flowers now and I'm really thankful for that mm-hmm. And it just goes back to Mama Mary. When I think about Mama Mary, she's just, all I think about is flowers and how her sweetness is and and how she brought so much sweetness in my life, especially when I was in the suffering. And even to this day, not only suffering, but just in everyday living. And I just call it, as I said before, I just call upon her and just random moments when when I feel like I need a mom, I just call upon her. And, and I'll be honest, like, I, I know I'm kind of jumping around here, but I'll be honest here, I'm the devotion that I'm not 100% in still, like, I do it here and there, but I gotta do better. It's the rosary, I gotta do better. For some reason, it's just so hard for me. But I'm not gonna be hard on myself, because God, he's so compassionate, so merciful, but at the same time, I'm gonna push myself. <laughs> because uh-huh. it's, there's so much graces in the rosary. Um, yeah. but I think Mama Mary definitely sees that I'm trying. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I get it. I get it. I uh, I don't know how to stop enough for the rosary. I I I still don't know how to really contemplate on the mysteries. I I think that you know when you pray the rosary, and I think that comes as a as a habit, right? And mm-hmm. I remember at some points I, I used to, but like now it's just harder for me. Maybe it's just something that the Lord needs to work in me again. One of the things is that you pray, you pray the rosary, you pray the rosary, right? And you're either not hearing what you're saying and you're just saying it, or you're so hyper aware that you're saying it that it feels like the 15, 20 minutes are an hour. At least for me, that's how it feels. It does feel like that for me too. So it's like you're either rushing for the decades or it feels like a slog. It feels like you're just like, it it, it feels like it's never ending. You're like, oh, the third mystery. You know, I think we need to ask our Blessed Mother to make it sweeter for us. That's the redemptive suffering. (laughs) Yeah. Yes, you're so right. Can I share something I think that may help? I still struggle with it, but I think this may be helpful. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. So it's regarding the the rosary so i'm gonna give an example with the joyful mysteries so it's still hard but this helps me kind of connect with the mysteries more So, like for example the joyful mysteries when it goes to the annunciation um of when the angel meets mary so we all know what happens there well not all maybe most right when the angel meets Mary, Mary says yes to carry the the Lord, the Savior of the world. So how I kind of like kind of make it more personal, maybe this is helpful um, to you and anyone that's listening, is that what I end up doing is like um, I say the mystery and I say a prayer and then I begin. So how I would make it personal, I'll be like, um, Mama Mary, through your intercession, please help me um, to just be more bold like you were when you say yes. Help me to develop that that courage like you did what it means to say yes in the midst of um fear the unknown um help me to grow in that and please pray for me and then when i pray to each hail mary um it's it's nine beads or ten nine beads or ten 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 and i consider each of those ten beads one rose at a time so each so each bead um i just start thinking about her 
I think about a rose, I just start praying it. Yeah, it all sounds beautiful and everything. It, it is very hard still to concentrate, but me doing it that way is very helpful. Same thing with the visitation of Mary to Elizabeth, the second joyful mystery. I I start praying again. I'm like, okay, uh, Mama, please intercede for me and help me to always be joyful when I see Jesus, especially in the Mass and the Eucharist. Help me to jump for joy as Elizabeth did when she saw you, just as John did in the womb leap for Jesus um, when, when, when he met Jesus in the other womb. Like, help me to be that joyful. Help me to live that joy out. Uh, especially as Catholic Christian. And I'm just going to keep going down. Same thing with the dirt. Um, when Jesus was born, um, I'll probably say something as like, um, oh, again, Mom Mary, please intercede for me. Um, help me to be as strong as you were, especially in the moment when you're literally giving birth in a place that's not the best for you. Help me to be strong in moments where I'm uncomfortable or to be humble enough to not always want the good things and just be content where I am as you were when you gave birth and so on. So I would just kind of take their moment and what happened and I'll try to turn it into a prayer for myself to help me encounter it more. I hope that makes sense. No, but that's what sense. really helps me um, like really get into the mystery. Yeah. And, and you know, um, yes, we yeah. should all pray the road three. I agree ten thousand percent. It's something that, that that's a devotion that throughout throughout the, the the life throughout the life of the church when the rosary came to be, like you can ask any saint, they're, they're praying the rosary. I would say that if you find the rosary a little daunting, maybe for now just ask the Blessed Mother to help you and do some hail marys, right? Whatever you can. Right, and I think God and through through the intercession of Mama, little by little, she'll she'll help you to gain that devotion through through the Rosary. Really quickly, since we're talking about, we've been talking about topology. You know what's really cool about uh, the visitation of a, of Mary of Elizabeth, like Mary visiting Elizabeth. One of the really cool things about it is that you know how I said Mary's the Ark. Yes. You know David danced in front of the ark. Wait, As say it again? David, you remember the King David that he would dance in front of the ark? I believe so. Memory is not. Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> so that was fulfilled through John the Baptist leaping in the womb of his mother as the ark was approaching. Oh my goodness. Another deep little mystery. <laughs> Another tidbit, I'm telling you. That's so beautiful. Isn't it crazy? Was this from the early church fathers or something that God revealed to you? It was it was a bit of both. Right. Oh also it was Benedict the sixteenth who says that um the first Eucharistic procession was Mary going to visit Elizabeth. Like her being the walking tabernacle and her bringing Jesus to her cousin yeah so fast that's so beautiful i know yes um and some other options since you mentioned um like how you said mama would give us the grace uh, well god will give us the grace and she will intercede for us and um to to pray a rosary um what's also really helpful is that sometimes when I'm like very intimidated by the rosary, I'll break it down throughout the day. Like in the morning, I'll probably do two mm -hmm. decades. If I have time in the afternoon, I'll probably do one. I'll just spread out throughout the whole day. I heard even some people like um, spread out th throughout the whole week. Maybe you got to do it that way to start it off one, de one decade a day. Or what's been a really big one for me right now is that I listen to it like on YouTube and I just sit and pray it. Or if it's on a podcast, I'll listen to it. That has been very helpful. But I'll definitely be giving the grace um, very soon to <laughs> be able to just do it on my own. And uh, it's also really easier to just also, if you're not using audio, is to do it with a group of people. Like, I find that so easier. It just, mo for me, it just motivates me to just do it. It helps me to be more, um, like, punitive with God in prayer. It just helps a lot. Help you carry that sweet cross that Mama's asking. 
I mean, we shouldn't call it a cost. I, I, I think for us, it feels like a cost for now. And I think eventually, you know, Mama will be like Simon was to Jesus on his way to uh, Calvary and just help us to really do what she's asking us to do. And, and it, it, you know, that's another thing I find interesting about the Blessed Mother is that she, in her in her vocation, is a mother. Like, yes. like she's a mother to us, right? Not just not just the mother of Ecclesia, like church. Yes, we are church, but like mother to us individually. I, we we God is so good that He loves us individually, but also God loves us so much that He gave us a mother that also loves us individually. Mm. Like she, her love is God's love, which means that God's love is endless, and God's love is as perfect and as ever flowing for you as it is for me, as it is for our spouses, as it is for our family members, as it is for those who aren't in the church. Like it's beautiful that Mary loves us in that individual way. We forget how intimate God becomes and how intimate God is with us. Yeah. Wow. I needed to hear that. It's like I just I'm just basking in God's presence right now. Like wow, like that was a good reminder. Yeah, he's just he loves us so much that he just becomes so intimate with us individually and the same with Mama Mary's like it's it's a relationship like you just they they love us so much that although they already know us they still want to get to know us it's just it's just so funny it's like god knows everything about us but he still wants us to go to him and sometimes i even say to the lord like it was so funny like i had a conversation with god yesterday i was just so tired i was like lord how are you doing i'm like i'm probably doing good you're god I'm like, how's life? I'm like, oh, I, I probably know what you're already doing, but here's my life. Like, <laughs> that's how I talk to him sometimes. <laughs> but I just know he just takes so much delight in that. And I know, like, our mother as well does as well. It's it's just so beautiful. Like, all, like, the patience that they have for us, you know? And they just meet us exactly where we are. <laughs> and they walk with us in our own little journey where we are. It's like, we all, we all are striving for the same thing and we all want the same thing well that is my hope my prayer especially to those that are even listening that we just want jesus heaven to be holy and and they just meet us where we are and they walk with us on our journey mm-hmm. you know it's funny the last question we already answered it naturally so it's beautiful um before i end are you ready for the rapid round of questions? Oh, yes. I'm ready. <laughs> what is your favorite animal? My favorite animal? Um, yes. um, a giraffe. A giraffe? Why? Um, I just like, you know, how they look. <laughs> I guess the color. I don't know. You said rapid, so that's the first thing that came to my head. I didn't know what else to say. <laughs> oh, no. I know my favorite animal. It's a wolf. A wolf. Am I saying it right? Yeah, wolf. Yeah, wolf. Yes, that's my favorite animal. Okay. Because they're beautiful. <laughs> if you could have one meal to eat, what would it be? One meal? One meal. One meal. What would it be? It would be fish. Fish. <laughs> the way you said it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Why fish? Um. Well, specifically salmon or salmon, but I say salmon. Tomato. Um, too. It's just so good. <laughs> yeah, it gives me what I need. <laughs> Finally, you're on a desert island. You can only bring three things with you. What would it be? Um, a flashlight. A desert island. My phone, hoping that there would be some satellite <laughs> I could try to call from help. And oh, three things I should have saved. Saved it. It's okay. Um, water. 
How much, how much water would you bring to the island? I'd probably bring like a case of water. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I didn't think this through. <laughs> I should have said like a tent or something. <laughs> no, it's perfectly fine. It's rapid. It's rapid. It's rapid. <laughs> Within that case, Jasmine, thank you so much for coming on. Um, I really appreciate the conversation and you taking the time to just hang out and be able to talk about our Lord with these wonderful people. Yes, and thank you for um, the invitation and for sharing your great thoughts as well. And I really appreciate this conversation. This was very fruitful and it really filled me up as well. Yeah, I mean, it helped me as well. Um, is there anything that you would like to speak about? I know that you have a social media account. I don't know if you're starting that up or not. Oh, yes. Um, so right now, it's currently offline for the month of June, but God willingly, it will start in July. But yes, I do have a social media account. Um, the social media account is called Grow and Live. Um, it's grow dot and dot live, and it's an account where I will be sharing the Roman Catholic faith and just really helping you become your full potential in God and how God created you to be and who he calls you to be, which is his disciples. And just an account where I'm just basically spreading the good news of Jesus Christ um, and just really sharing my love for Christ and the Catholic faith. Um, and one last thing I do want to say is that if you're struggling with Mama Mary, it's really okay. We're all on our own journey. Um, we're all on our own walk. And I invite you to just keep keep talking to God about it. And God will bring you the right people. He will He will help you. Like God is a God of miracles. He He knows your heart. Um and He will help you understand His mother and her role. Don't give up yet. I'm telling you, when you get to know her, when you have a relationship with her, it will change everything. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Jazz. Amen. And we will see you guys later. Bye, y'all. Bye.